Hi, Dr. Leo. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Can you please introduce yourself for our listeners? I'm Peter Leo. I'm a clinical assistant professor of dermatology and pediatrics at Northwestern University, Feinberg School of Medicine, and I'm the founding director of the Chicago Integrative Eczema Center in Chicago, Illinois. What factors should clinicians consider when selecting a biologic or systemic therapy to manage atopic dermatitis? You know, for a long time, I often felt like a failure when I had to go and graduate up to a systemic agent for my atopic dermatitis patients. This is before I was really focused. And in part, it was because what we had in the past was all off-label, there were a lot of safety issues, and you know, there really were some real perilous aspects of doing that. But now I'm so happy to say we actually have some FDA approved treatments that are not only really effective, but actually have very reasonable safety profiles. So for the right patient, I think they can be an incredible fit. The most important thing, and the thing that I really talk about with my patients is that we have to be in it together. We have to do this as a shared decision-making exercise. I want them to understand the risks, the benefits, the goals, and even some of the things about how long we're gonna be on it. I always try to say it's nothing is forever. You know, maybe we need to do this for quite some time to get the disease in remission, to get you better, but ultimately I'm hopeful that we're gonna be able to at least reduce some of these medicines or sometimes change them. That's the other beautiful thing of having multiple options. We can do something for a while and then say, let's give your body a break from this one. We're gonna do something different. And frankly, it's kind of luxurious because again, in the past, we simply didn't have this. Most of all though, I think we really do try to follow that therapeutic ladder. We build up little by little, making sure that we're doing each step carefully. Are we sure we're doing good moisturization? Are we sure we're doing gentle bathing? Are we avoiding things that we know will trigger the skin? Are they actually using the medicine? Because sometimes patients get referred to me and they say, no, I actually didn't really put any of those creams on. In which case we might hit the stop button and say, before we graduate to a more powerful systemic agent, let's go back to our basics first. But for the right patient, I really think they're an incredible boon for their life. It can give them their life back. It can give them their sleep back. And so many patients have said that this has changed everything and they're really able to get back to being a person again. Effective and prompt diagnosis for atopic dermatitis can be a bit tricky at times. What is your personal approach for effective diagnosis? I feel lucky because I often consider myself more of a therapeutics-focused dermatologist than a diagnostic one, and I'm often in awe of the great diagnosticians. Some of my teachers, I feel like they could walk into a room and pull out an obscure diagnosis from the tiniest clues. They were Sherlock Holmesian in their way. I'm not quite like that, and I'm lucky that atopic dermatitis is usually pretty straightforward. That being said, not always. And one of the red flags, I think, is for a patient who has failed a number of treatments that really do usually work for atopic dermatitis, that makes me go back to the very beginnings and say, okay, are we sure this is atopic dermatitis? What are the things I want to rule out? I want to say, could there be an allergic contact dermatitis component to this? Sometimes it's really two things. They're maybe allergic to cocomidopropyl betaine in their shampoo, or they're allergic to something, a preservative or something in one of the creams I'm giving them, propylene glycol, for example. So we want to exclude that for adults in particular, but even for kids, we have to ask the question, could this be cutaneous T cell lymphoma, which can present as atopic dermatitis-like eruption going on for a long time? Could this be a drug and so on? So I often do have to think about those things, but for the most part, the history and the clinical presentation allows us to make a clinical diagnosis and jump right in with treatment. How can clinicians execute effective shared decision-making strategies in the management of chronic skin conditions such as atopic dermatitis? This is my favorite kind of question because you know that shared decision making is so important and I will say when I was younger I kind of turned up my nose and like oh who needs that like I just we, we can figure it out but now I really appreciate the idea of going through some of those steps and first it really just begins with establishing that rapport getting to know the patient a little bit I wish there was a shortcut but there's really not you want to get to to know them you want to listen to what are their concerns what are their goals what are the things that they've tried and failed in the past the one thing I hear over and over and over from patients is they say I saw several different clinicians and they all gave me the same thing and it was so frustrating because you know maybe it's the same one pound jar of cord and they said, I've used this and this, I told you that's why I'm here. And they really feel unheard. So listening to their hopes, listening to what they're, what they're thinking about, and then presenting the options. And sometimes I'm, I'm a goofball and I say an option that they say, well, Dr. Leo, I told you I've already tried that. I say, I'm so sorry. Okay, let's take that off the table. But putting them out there earnestly and saying, here's what I think of this one. Here's what I think of this one. And then I really often do like to interject my opinion. You know, I think given 
given what you've told me, given your presentation, given what you've tried before, I think this might be the best choice. Here's why. What do you think? And then you've got to shut up and listen. And sometimes I even give them extra time. I say, I don't want you to decide today. If I feel there's a lot of anxiety or it's a big family decision, I say, why don't you go home tonight, think about it, call me later, call me next week. There's no rush, I mean, except for the patient suffering. But in the big picture, if they've been suffering for three years, what's another night or two? I want them to make a good decision. And I always say, nothing is irreversible. If we start something and they don't like it, we'll stop it, you know, and bad things can happen, even with the best intention. So we were gonna be paying attention and we will stop it and we'll go a different direction. Thank you for your time today, Dr. Leo, and thank you for being here with us. It was very informative and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here.